So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the another online causal inference seminar. Today, we have a uh, great pleasure to introduce Matt Stanstrud and Aaron Savage from EPFL, who will be jointly giving a talk on interpretational errors in causal inference and how to avoid them. Uh, we have two discussants today, Carolus Manis from Western and Vanessa Didele from uh, Bremen Institute, uh, later discussing the talk. So there, there will be hopefully a lively discussion. In the Q&A, we have Lan Wen from University of Waterloo, who will be handling your questions. Most of the questions today will be handled by Lan. If there are some more in-depth questions, the speakers have asked to uh, take those at the end. So hope you enjoy the talk. Today, the question session will and the discussion session will be handled by Razi. Razi is one of our new moderators. So let's hope uh, you all welcome uh, Razi very warmly, and Razi, I'll switch over to you to just say a few words. So Thanks, feel free to... Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So as, as usual, uh, if you have any questions, please submit them using the Zoom's Q&A as soon as you have them. And uh, Lon will be answering the questions using the chat. And if there are any remaining questions, the speakers will answer them at the end of their, their talk. Um, yeah, so Matt, please take it away. The floor is yours. Yeah, so feel free to start sharing. Sorry. Thank for you the so late much. Talk. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here and be uh, having you all listening to this talk. Uh, we will go a bit into the abstract land today, but it's all grounded in things and questions that are very practical. So before we do that, I want us to uh, study three concrete examples. All of them has a common thread. So one thing that is characteristics of settings where clinicians are interested in policies for, for organ transplant is that the organ transplants are a limited resource. We don't have enough organs at any point in time to give to all patients on waiting lists. That's precisely why we have waiting lists. And therefore, there are many clinical studies where they study associations between organs of different quality and outcomes in patients. Another setting where resources can be of limited supply are in ICU units, where, for example, during health crisis, such as the COVID pandemic, there was a, a lack of beds for, for all patients that were in need. And in several big venues, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a call for guidelines for how to prioritize patients so that we could protect the doctors for, for doing these these tasks uh, in, in, a, in a rush where they had to improvise. And this is reflected in some concrete guidelines, for example, in New York State, where they have guidelines for prioritizing patients for, uh, with, with different needs for, for urgent treatment. A third case that's been, um, been discussed a lot in top journals for many decades, in fact, is, is the choice of surgeon. So many associational studies have looked at the association between the volume that a surgeon has, so how many surgeries the surgeon does, and the quality of outcomes in that surgeon. These are also studied in several major publications in the big journals, such as New England Journal of Medicine. So the studies I've referred to, all of them have been in top clinical journals, and we haven't looked at any of the details in those studies. They, they all look at associations, uh, but there seems to be a lingering uh, causal question that that is common to them and but before we can start doing the causal inference we we need to figure out what our question is and and how do we even start in this setting so fortunately we can build on work that's been done for a long time in in the literature we know well so we can stand on the shoulders of some giants and i i will consider one of them here that I'm often inspired by, who stated the following in the 1987 paper, that we have data, that's just a string of numbers. These data typically uh, represent empirical measurements, and we can draw, we can do calculations and, and do analysis on these numbers. But the key thing is that whereas it's easy to state mathematically what these strings of numbers are and what the computer algorithms do, it's not always that easy to formalize the plain English sentences expressing the actual causal questions the, the, the practitioners have. So this 
It's something Jamie Robbins wrote in 1987 after his seminal 1986 paper. And it's based on the philosophy in this 1986 paper, uh, at least my interpretation of it, where, which was um, firmly grounded in concrete questions about causal effect of interventions or exposures in occupational health settings. So the key here is that it starts with a question. And the idea of starting with the question has now been popularized uh, along the lines that, that Jamie Robbins and others suggested many decades ago, for example, in frameworks, target trial frameworks for causal inference and causal roadmaps, which, which both of them start with the idea that the causal question is first, and that's the first step to articulate the causal questions and then move forward with analysis. And this is not something that's unique to the by statistics of epidemiological literature, if you go to econ, Heckman has, for example, written that the primary question regarding the choice of an empirical approach to analyzing economic data should be, what economic question does the analyst seek to answer? Okay, so when resources are limited and we are interested in causal effects, there are a few challenges. So the first challenge, which is the common feature of these settings, we, we, in particular the three examples we studied, is that when we decide on a, on a treatment regime, for example, when we decide to give a patient an ICU bed, it means that that ICU bed is not available for necessarily the next patient that comes in. So whatever treatment decision we do in one patient might affect the treatment that we can give to the next patient, which in turn also might affect their outcomes. So the, there are dependencies between units, at least under the regimes we want to study. Okay, and adding to this, when doctors or others making such decisions, they're not making the decisions for one patient only based on the characteristics of that particular patient. That's precisely what the wait list is. So they make decisions not only based on one individual's characteristics, but also about all the other ones, say, in a cluster of individuals. And this is again reflected in these allocation or guidelines and, and triage rules where individuals are ranked based on their clinical symptoms and, and, and other scores. And, and based on this ranking, they're prioritized for treatments. Okay. So if you were to formalize this, so if you start with the question and really want to formalize this, we would think about treatment regimes here denoted by capital GN, that depends on features of not one individual, but all individuals in a particular cluster. But suppose we have N individuals, and these treatment regimes we would be interested in would be functions of potentially the covariates of all of these individuals. And this is not the same as what, what is seemed to be more common and conventional in the dynamic treatment regime literature, and, and where treatment rules are based on for one individual I is based on only that individual's characteristics. Another thing we need to keep in mind is that not only under the, the, the potential new counterfactual or potential regimes we want to study, there might be dependencies between the units, but that may also be the case in the observed data. Because the doctors in real life, when you have your hospital data, say from a clinical registry, did make decisions that did not only depend on that individual eyes covariates, but possibly also one other ones that were in the ward at the same time, which means that we do not have IID data. So if you were to be serious about this question-led approach to causal inference, which we here I will denote an ideal approach, we would start with formalizing estimates under regimes such as GN, which do not seem to be prevalent or not at least to our knowledge in the literature at this, uh, this point in time, and also accept and, and therefore study identification conditions in settings where the observed data are not IID, which of course there's a rich literature on interference uh, and working on these things. But again, it leads to some, some obstacles that, that are more difficult to handle than in the IID setting. So this is one approach to, to causal inference, but now, uh, and we discussed this in a paper that we will post on archive soon, not today, but soon. Uh, but there are other ways of doing causal inference as well. And I'll let Aaron take over and discuss this from now on. Okay, thank you so much, Mats. Uh, so yeah, so I want to uh, take a step back and reemphasize uh, this challenge that we're faced when we're uh, trying to do an impactful, meaningful analysis. And we're confronted with 
uh, these two spaces. So we have a, a space of the questions that we want to answer, the public health relevant questions, and we have a space of parameters. So these are the mathematically uh, rigorously defined uh, parameters that we can use to, uh, to make a very uh, deductive, uh, systematic approach to doing a data analysis. And this, in a question-led approach, we are faced with the task of selecting a parameter that is most corresponding to our question of interest. And pre-causal revolution, we're constrained to selecting this parameter from a narrower set, from a set of observed data, classical observed data parameters, possibly a covariate adjusted mean, for example. What the causal revolution did was elaborate this space of causal parameters so that it included parameters that were mathematically and rigorously defined and that explicitly corresponded with our questions of interest. And then we can make a very robust mapping between a question of interest and uh, a causal parameter. And importantly, these causal parameters and these statistical observed data parameters are defined in the same probability space. And so we can specify models which will make connections between these observed data and causal parameters, and that's identification. And the nice thing about this, this these frameworks for causal inference is that they are rich and they contain many causal parameters so that when we have a new question, then we can simply go and search in this space, this space of causal parameters and locate the appropriate ideal causal parameter of interest and target that. And you know, for example, the approach that Moss was starting to uh, trace out in the limited resource setting might do the exact same thing, although we might have to work a little bit harder to find uh, what that corresponding causal parameter is. Uh, but the interesting thing about these this space of causal parameters is that one not necessarily explore the space of parameters in connection with the space of questions. This space of uh, causal parameters can be explored independently. Okay, so it's a, it's almost a playground for uh, mathematicians for for you know, for studying this interesting uh, mathematical formal space. In particular, we can look we can look for causal parameters that have particular statistical properties. Okay, so we may start to articulate causal parameters independently of the space of causal questions, uh, but then always, you know, since we're in an applied discipline, try to map these uh, new causal parameters back onto the space of questions. So find the question of interest that most corresponds to a newly articulated uh, causal parameter. But the question is, are these connections between these newly articulated causal parameters and the questions that we have of interest, are they robust? In particular, are they any different in nature than the not very robust suspect connections that were made between associational parameters and questions of interest prior to the causal revolution? And this is not just a theoretical uh, phenomenon. Uh, this phenomenon, I think, is, is really well illustrated by the history of mediation analysis. Okay, so one could break up the history of mediation analysis into distinct phases. One could recognize a preformal period in mediation analysis characterized by some of the, you know, the seminal work of Sewell Wright and his path diagrams that and, and certain parameters that decomposed uh, correlation uh, coefficients. And, and also the work of Barron and Kenny in 1986, one of the most highly cited uh, uh, quantitative methodological articles of all time, maybe over 100,000 citations, uh, which we recognize now is somewhat problematic in their conflation of mediation parameters with the regression coefficients. The causal revolution with respect to mediation, one could recognize that transition happening with some seminal papers by uh, Jamie and Sander in 1992 and Pearl in 2001, uh, who introduced model-free definitions of mediation parameters, the, the, what we all understand as the natural direct effects, 
And these were interesting, particularly interesting because they uh, they decomposed total effects on the individual level. Uh, the, the other important contribution is that they really clarified some of the uh, identi interesting identification assumptions that were necessary to identify these parameters of interest from observed data. Okay. Uh, but there was a really interesting uh, development in this history in, in this formal period in 2005. There was this important paper by Avin, Spitzer, and Pearl, who showed us that in many common settings encountered by practitioners, that one of the essential assumptions that's needed to non-parametrically identify the natural direct effects is contradicted by graphical structures that represent settings that investigators commonly find themselves in. So this is the presence of a mediator outcome confounder that is a descendant of the treatment that's caused by treatment. So this has been termed a recanting witness. And to just to reiterate, the natural direct effect is not non-parametrically identified when there's this sort of graphical causal structure in general. So this spurred a new period, what, I, what I've called the, the pragmatic period in mediation analysis, uh, where, and, and I'm about to do a big, show you many slides at once, but it really stimulated a lot of activity in the mediation literature, uh, um, where there were articulated in this literature uh, many alternative mediation parameters with different statistical properties, most of them characterized by stochastic interventions or defined in, ter uh, in terms of stochastic interventions. So to bring us back to this metaphor of the, uh, the space of uh, parameters at the center of the space is the natural direct effect and these contributions published in, in some of the top uh, 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 statistics and econometrics journals are elaborating the space. They're locating new causal parameters that are conceptually proximal to the, the, the first you know, index mediational parameter, the natural direct effect, but with different properties in mind. So they're designed to have particular properties. Uh, in particular, that they are identifiable under these, under these models where recanting witnesses are present and they may also be amenable, more amenable to uh, efficient estimation, uh, et cetera. Okay. Another really, really important, more recent development is uh, that taught us a lot about some of these alternative parameters is the articulation of, of a particular property that we think we would really want in many with many of these mediational pr parameters, uh, which is, a sharp mediational null criterion. So this was articulated by Caleb Miles, who I know gave a talk recently at the seminar that was very good and was elaborated also by Yvonne Diaz in a recent paper in JRSSB. And so uh, in essence, this sharp mediational null criterion stated that you know, a, a, an indirect effect parameter that has this criterion uh, will, if that parameter is non-zero, then it should necessarily be the case that there is an individual level indirect effect for at least one individual in the population. Okay, so if it's non-zero, we should know that there is some indirect effect going on. And, and we've learned through these works that this is not always the case with some of these alternative parameters that were proposed during this period. Okay, so just to summarize this pragmatic period, there was a focus on alternative mediation parameters that were designed to be identifiable that also uh, shared conceptual proximity with the natural direct effect original parameter. They also decomposed total effects, though not necessarily the average treatment effect. And uh, we learned to care about this sharp mediational null criterion. Okay. So this pragmatic period had a lot of twists and turns, and I'm going to borrow a, a trope uh, from one of Caleb Miles' talks that I, I found really useful. So during this period, there was this vacillating 
you're getting vacillating answers to this question, is mediation analysis hard or is it easy? And so post Ovin, this recanting witness paper, uh, it was hard. The natural direct effect we realized is rarely identifiable under common uh, graphical structures in non-parametric settings. But with the advent of these novel alternatives to casting mediation estimates, apparently mediation analysis was easy again. We had a way to proceed. But the contribution of Caleb and, and others shows us that it's not so easy after all, because we need to really care about one of these particular properties, uh, the, in particular, the sharp mediational null criterion, so it's hard. Most recently, there's been work in the same spirit of, define, of, of uh, defining alternative mediation parameters that do indeed you know, share many of the characteristics of the parameters articulated during this pragmatic period so that they are identifiable under recanting witness structures and they have they satisfy the sharp mediational null criterion. Uh, so perhaps it's easy again. Uh, but the question is, are mediation parameters, the appropriateness of a particular mediation parameter, is that appropriateness reducible to satisfaction of a finite set of properties? So some of the properties that we've cared about, we've se seemingly cared about during this period is a decomposition of a total effect, that it's conceptually proximal to the natural direct effect in some way, that it's identifiable, that it satisfies a sharp mediational null criterion. But we need to realize that all these alternative parameters are distinct causal entities with distinct interpretations and possibly very distinct consequences, at least their value is may have very distinct consequences for public health. Okay, and they can differ in meaningful ways from the natural direct effect. Okay. So the the risk possibly, and this is starting now as a hypothesis, is that the current pragmatic approach to mediation analysis creates cognitive conditions for interpretive errors. Okay. And in particular, uh, it may create the conditions for an error that we've termed identity slippage. And there's a formal definition that I that I won't uh, review very closely right now, but the heuristic is that an investigator starts with their question, they recognize it as a mediation question, they immediately think of, for example, the, the natural direct effect, and then they're faced with this uh, remaining process of specifying a model, of identifying uh, an observed data functional that corresponds to their causal question of interest, of selecting an estimator, and in the end of an analysis, interpreting their results. But we saw during this history of mediation that oftentimes the models that are required for, ide for identification of these ideal causal parameters are not realistic. And so instead, they select a different parameter. They take a pragmatic approach, they select a different distinct causal parameter. And this is actively, in fact, actively encouraged in this methodological literature that is, is developing these alternative mediation parameters. So this is one quote from one of the authors of this paper. And they write, if one is not comfortable with the identifiability assumptions of the natural direct effect, then one can view the proposed parameter as a parameter of interest. Okay, so they're encouraging practitioners to select this alternative parameter. Then they can specify a more realistic model, which does in fact identify their alternative causal parameter of interest and proceed down with uh, a usual analysis. But there's a risk. And the risk is that at the very end of the analysis, when they are interpreting their results in a discussion section of a paper, for example, that they interpret their analysis, the number they compute at the very end, consistent with the causal parameter that they ideally wanted to study in the first place and not consistent with the alternative pragmatic parameter that they chose to study explicitly. Okay, and this, uh, this conjecture, this hypothesis that this is commonly occurring, it has some empirical implications. So we went out to study this. So we obtained, uh, we conducted a systematic review and, and meta-analysis. We obtained a population of applied articles uh, 
implementing the randomized interventional analog of the natural direct effect. And this is one of the alternative stochastic mediation parameters. Uh, we abstracted relevant data from these articles, um, in particular excerpts of the interpretive claims about the causal parameters throughout different sections of the applied manuscripts. And then we coded that data. So we, for example, we scored each section of the paper as negative for an interpretational error. If at least one of their interpretive claims in this, that section indicated that a stochastic mediation parameter was targeted. So if they are transparent about targeting one of these alternative parameters as opposed to the natural direct effects. Otherwise, we coded that section as making an interpretational error, in particular, what we called identity slippage. Okay, so I'll go quickly through this. We, you know, we reviewed almost a thousand articles and we included 16 uh, applications in our analysis. And what we found was, was somewhat alarming that, there, that this the prevalence and frequency of these types of errors was, was quite high. And in fact, it, it had very predictable patterns. So across different sections of a, an applied manuscript that the frequency of these sorts of interpretational errors increased as, the, as you progressed through a manuscript. And they occurred more frequently in, for example, in discussion sections where uh, uh, um, authors tend to uh, be slightly less formal than they are in other sections. Okay. So to take us back to our, our original uh, example that Mott's introduced to us of, of limited resource settings, uh, in fact, there have been there's you know been work methodological work in the sp spirit of a pragmatic approach already, and, and these uh, papers have been published in uh, top journals as well most recently. And, and the basic premise of of these alternative approaches in the limited resource settings is to find an optimal individualized dynamic treatment rule subject to the constraint that the probability of treatment assignment under this rule is less than some pre-specified value, okay? So reading this literature, you might think, is causal inference in limited resource settings easy? Okay, but the issue here, as there is a potential issue in the, in the mediation literature, is that the methods based on these individualized dynamic treatment rules equate the limited resource setting with a simple marginal constraint. Okay, so they are articulating alternative parameters that satisfy certain statistical properties and mapping them back onto uh, the limited resource question of interest. Uh, but in reality, and, and Mott started to touch on this, limited resource settings are characteristically more complex. And so the policy relevant methods must contend with these additional characteristic features lest they be at risk for the same sorts of interpretational errors that we measured in the mediation literature. And with that, I'll pass it off to Mons. So Aaron raised now some problems and defined this idea of an interpretational error quite abstractly, but we had a concrete example from the mediation literature. And before I return to the mediation literature, I will just um, remind us a bit about what I talked about before and Aaron finished with. So, but now with a picture. So in this IDTR literature, so the individualized uh, dynamic treatment regime literature, they would usually think about uh, a superpopulation of uh, individuals that are IID, and then they draw inference on these IID individuals. But in our setting, this would not be entirely appropriate because we believe that there is there are connections between the units in our sample or in particular like a cluster that we can define and rather than thinking about these these um these units then as iid we think about the cluster as drawn from some superpopulation of clusters and within each of these clusters there might be individuals say patients that are causally connected and if we start with that as the premise and start doing inference in such a framework, we face some difficulties. So as before, or as in the usual IID framework, we have N individuals, but now the units of the superpopulations are now clusters instead of these, these each of these units of individuals. And the number of units we have is now one. We don't have N units. So we have essentially 
n equals one in the sense of clusters, but in which clusters we have individuals. So what can we do? Well, before we go into the inference, which we need to formalize that uh, formalized assumptions to do, we can at least now we get something too. We, we are now allowed to explicitly express the causal connections between units. And something I don't want to talk about in detail now, but you can return to it in discussion, is that in these limited resource settings, we might, unlike for the other classical interference settings, such as social networks, we might have a good idea about how these causal connections occur, for example, through an explicit ranking. The other thing is that we can explicitly define these regimes, which now are functions of all units covariates in the cluster. And our estimates will look different. So they're not now expectations over these uh, I units in the superpopulation, but they might be expectations over uh, a mean in a cluster under a given treatment rule that is more complex than usual. Okay, so this, I only gave you a teaser here and the, 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 the manuscript will, you will see um, online soon, but I also want to relate this back to the mediation literature where, where, where Aaron made a big deal. And it seemed like Aaron took it as a premise that natural effects correspond to precise practical questions. He grounded many of his arguments in the natural direct effects. So should we just take that as a face value? Some people argue yes. Pearl, for example, would say that natural effects are precisely what lawmakers instruct us to consider in race or sex discrimination cases. And uh, he backs that up with a claim from uh, the Seventh Circuit Court and which is cited in this book, where it says the central question in any employment discrimination case is whether the employer would have taken the same action had the employee been of a different race uh, or sex or religion, a different covariate, and everything else had been the same. And this is also something Razia Nabi and Nida Spitzer has, has cited in papers and also in a, in a OCIS talk. So suppose we take that, that take it as a fact that the, the this is a question about natural effects, then one possible issue is that uh, it's not entirely clear what it means that what we say when we say that had the employee been of a different race or sex or religion. But Pearl elaborates on that. So in a psychological methods article from, from 2014, he writes further, arguing for mediation, that a policymaker might be interested in assessing the extent to which gender disparity in hiring can be reduced by making higher decisions gender blind, compared with eliminating gender inequality in education or job qualifications. So the first question here is about gender blindness. That seems to something I will discuss shortly is something that seems feasible to study from an interventionist point of view. The second question, eliminating gender inequality in education or job qualifications seems to be harder. And there's a rich literature, for example, in epidemiology discussing the difficulties in, in thinking about causal effects of, of, of such comparisons. And you see one quote down there. But let's, let's play with the first part here. So the gender blindness. One way to interpret it is, is what would happen if we had changed the, the gender and, and, and changed, say, the or the sex on the CV and on all the application documents, okay? But what we do then is we are not anymore studying um, effects of race. We are studying effects of a different variable, which is the inferred race from a job application or a CV. That's a different random variable that you can give to whatever, the committee evaluating these job applications. And then we can think about causal effects of changing that variable irrespective of the unit's actual race. And then we can look at mediators such as whether or not the individual gets an interview and then later on whether they will be hired for a particular job. But the point with this is that then we can articulate clear effects of the inferred race versus status quo say on hiring decisions. And this is precisely in line with the interventionist type of thinking. So even if this these arguments made by Pearl alluded to a mediation-like estimate. This is now simply expressed in terms of a single world counterfactual, a single average treatment effect, if you want, or population average treatment effect, where you compare status quo with some type of intervention. Okay. And in the in, in other types, other literatures, they've even done experiments like that, where they've explicitly did done experiments to 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 change names and 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 other things on CVs to, 
make them appear as different from, from the individual's identity. Okay. So this is something we discussed in a, in, a, in a manuscript, how we can do inference on these kind of things, even in the presence of certain unmeasured confounding. And this is also now something that's appeared in the latest version of the book by Hanan and Robbins, which where they made similar arguments concurrently. Uh, and again, if you recognize the structure as talking about something that's a deterministic descendant of something in the observed data, that's very similar to a lot of ideas that's been in now recently in the interventionist mediation literature where they would would challenge the use in general of parameters like natural direct and indirect effects this was pioneered by jamie robbins and thomas richardson already in 2010 and is now gaining much more attention okay so and i will return a bit to these mediation questions before that i want us to be on the same page so what have we done so far so what is the what is the point about being so pedantic about these questions does it even matter so one idea which was very made very concrete by by the systematic review is that there are made errors in the interpretation in the literature and one way of avoiding them might perhaps be to start explicitly with the question of interest. Okay. And by being explicit about these type of errors, we can maybe be more responsible and also avoid them in the future. And that's something we have seen with different types of errors that's been um, made, been coined with fancy names and th thereby made very famous, such as publication bias, p-hacking, and the garden of working paths. But you might say that this, this stylish idea of starting with a question, translating it to an estimate, this, this is not something that's trivial. In fact, it requires specification of a lot of details. So even in this study where I argued that the effect of the, um, this effect is, this was alluded to as an indirect effect of, of, um, race say on a hiring decision is better reflected by an intervention on this kind of intervening variable which is not at all capturing all effects of race there are many other effects of race on the outcome of interest and many other associations between race and the outcome of interest but just capturing this very particular effect about the comedy's impression of that individual's race but that requires a new story similar to the requirement of new stories in this modern interventionist mediation literature and you might say this is this seems uncomfortable because it puts a burden on the investigator to come up with these stories. But I would rather see it as a feature rather than a bug, which is something Thomas Richardson said in a talk a few years ago. And the reason for that is it precisely requires to be very clear and transparent about the effects and questions we want to answer and the practical relevance of these effects, how they can be realized in the real world and how we can uh, challenge them in the future empirically in future experiments. And it's also a good exercise in that it helps us to think about uh, new types of treatment, new type of interventions that we feasibly can conduct. And the last thing I would say is also that this type of exercise might help us getting new identification results. And with that, I will return back to the, the last um, intervening variable slash mediation example. So suppose this was the DAG describing this type of example where in the first place, A could be, say, gender, some sensitive variable. Uh, M should be um, invitation to an interview, and Y should be eventually hiring. And there might be some unmeasured common causes here, and also some measured ones. Okay. The story we gave was that it seems impossible to intervene on A, and it's at least it's not clear what it means, such an intervention. But we might be able to do, at least conceive this intervention on the comment um, impression of the candidate's sex or candidate's race. And by drawing this explicit in, in this uh, extended graph, which is inspired by this seminal idea by Robinson and Richardson in 2010, we can start making identification arguments, okay? And if you do this kind of identification arguments under classical assumptions of consistency and positivity, in addition to um, this relaxed unmeasured confounding assumptions where we actually allow a confounder between A and Y, we can derive that the causal effect of the intervening variable, 
or the average outcome when we intervene on this intervening variable is identified by this famous front door formula. But you might again challenge me or us and say, well, before you did this, it was already known that um, different type of mediation parameter, the so-called population interventional effect, would be identified also by the front door formula. In fact, under the same graphical structure that you started with, without including the, the bold arrow in the additional variable. Well, we cannot counter-argue and say, well, they relied on cross-world independence assumptions that are untestable even in principle, and they also need different type of assumptions than we did. And it wasn't entirely clear what the story is. But more, more than that, we can also argue that we can get these identification results in even more um, elaborate or at least different settings. So the graph we studied, I look like this, where the arrow from L goes into A. But suppose I consider this different graph where A actually causes L. Then L is a recanting witness, which is terminology from Spitzer and or Avin and Spitzer, but um, theory developed by Spitzer. Uh, and, and thus, the population intervention indirect effect is not identified. OK? And this is not just something I take out of the blue, because this particular graph was specifically studied in a paper, an epidemiology paper, that used the population PIIE to study the effect of an ill-defined intervention, pain, chronic pain, in fact, on the outcome, which was mortality. And they heard chronic pain mediated by opioid use. But they ran into a problem, because they weren't sure whether their measured variable depression was caused by the pain, or if it was the depression that actually caused the pain. So they didn't know which direction they were to put this arrow. If you take an interventionist approach to this problem, you will easily see that it doesn't matter. The identification result is exactly the same. The parameter will then also differ from the PIIE because the PIIE is not identified, whereas in general, the interventional effect is. And in both cases, the question is exactly the same as well. In their setting, it would be, what would be the effect of of, of intervening on the intervening variable. In the case, it would be intervening on, on the committee's perception of the race or sex. In the, in the example, which I haven't studied, uh, told you about in detail, but from the epidemiological literature, it would not be intervening on the individual's chronic pain, but it would be intervening on the doctor's perception of the individual's chronic pain. So how the doctor would deal with the individual's chronic pain. So with that, I will argue, or I will stop this talk and say that we, I will not argue that pragmatism is always bad or that we should refuse pragmatic, pragmatic approaches to causal inference. But at least in this literature that seems to be going pragmatic directions, they should be open about the choice of that they are pragmatic and also recognize the potential dangers of being pragmatic. And we would also emphasize that there are other approaches, which is to at least strive to be ideal and strive to really focus heavily on formalizing the question into a formal parameter, which does not at all guarantee you that uh, you do target the right question of interest, but this is at least something you can keep in the back of your head when you're trying to target practical causal inference, practical questions with causal inference methods. So I'll stop it there and leave it for questions. Thank you, Max and Aaron, for this wonderful talk. Um, there were a couple of questions in the Q&A, which were already taken care of by Lon. Uh, so I think we can switch over to the discussants. Um, so Vanessa and Carlos, please take it away. And I believe if you have time, we can also take questions from the audience. OK, shall I start? Please do, yeah. Can you hear me? OK, great. Thank you very much for this very interesting and very simulating talk. Um, I want to say essentially two things. Um, one, first of all, I uh, want to echo that um, this, this struggle with understanding mediation analysis or with dealing with mediation analysis, I find this very much also in my own um, practice working with epidemiologists, for example, um, when we uh, want to clarify what is the research question and then um, for some reason, they think uh, they, they want to do a, me a mediation analysis. And then I try and get at the reasons for why, what is it that you want to do? What decisions are going to be influenced by your analysis? 
And then often the answers that you get when you drill down are not about mediation. They are about um, where do we intervene? And that's not a mediation question. And it's a bit like in the story that uh, Matt and Aaron were saying, should we blind the CVs? Yeah, that, that's also another intervention. It's not in itself about mediation. It's about what can we do? Um, or it's about a controlled direct effect, which is something different than the natural effects. It doesn't have the additivity and, and uh, direct and indirect effect, um, summing up to a total effect. So controlled direct effects are easier to identify in terms of the complexity of the assumptions. Or it's often about joint intervention. So if we intervene here and here, uh, what do we want? And I would um, encourage uh, people to really, when you think just because here's an exposure, here's an outcome, and there are things that happen in between, uh, don't just do a mediation analysis just because you can, but uh, drill down to what uh, questions, what decisions do you want to answer? What is it really about, you know, what to intervene or uh, what do you want to do uh, in order to get closer to the research question? And um, what I now see emerging with uh, the work that uh, Matt and Aaron have um, presented is need and maybe there's two augmented um, you know, stories with augmented variables, um, like in this case, the um, intervening variable, or we also know from separable effects that's also augmenting the story. And maybe that is, um, often what's what's missing and, and people know we've measured these variables, this is our data, and we have to somehow stick with this, but maybe that that can't represent really the, the research question. For example, you people look at biomarkers and the effect, causal effect of biomarkers, but there is no causal effect of biomarkers. You can't go and change a biomarker. You can change other things that will then change the biomarker. And so you need to extend the story. And so I find this very interesting. And I think we should put uh, more effort into this direction of extending the stories to really tell um, what it is that, that we want to get at that will answer the, the meaningful research question. I don't know if you want to comment, maybe Matt and Aaron. I agree a lot with what you're saying there. So uh, about this augmentation. Agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm also questioning, I'm not, the, I'm not, well, this people have said before me, but when people argue for the relevance of many of these mediation parameters, they often start talking in, in terms of extended stories, which we could encode in our formal mathematical language. And then the whole game of mediation analysis often seems moot. Which means that it can be formalized with some type of different regime or a dynamic regime, uh, control direct effect, or simply an average treatment effect of a different type of variable. But that's a, an opinion. I let uh, Carolus um, um, ask the next question. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks, Mats and Aaron, for the talk and for inviting me to be a discussant. And I should also say that I've been lucky to read the paper on which some of this stuff is based, but the audience, unfortunately, can't read that yet. Um, hopefully, it'll be on archive soon. Um, but I think um, I want to make three broad um, comments or questions. I think that you made some descriptive claims here and some normative um, claims, and I want to comment on well, I want to criticize the descriptive claims in two ways and then the normative claim in one and see how you react. Don't take this as a deep held belief of mine. I just want to challenge you a little bit. Um, so the first thing, and you, you did this also in the paper, is you created a tension um, between practitioners of methods and developers of methods. And I, I, I think you argue that you know, the methodologists have expanded the space of parameters by inventing new parameters um, that, you know, may or may not relate to questions of interest, but they continue to, you know, they, they some parameter exists, um, it runs into problems um, that you refer to them sometimes as, you know, statistical issues, and then an, another parameter arises because it has maybe desirable statistical properties. Um, and, you know, what I want to 
challenge is that I think that it, it sort of um, takes away some of the agency from the practitioners of methods. I think that, you know, let's consider the mediation um, problem. If the natural direct effect was palatable to practitioners of methods in all settings, then we would be done. <laughs> no, you know, I don't think that um, uh, pre uh, methods developers would have gone on to expand the space of parameters of interest because, you know, we would have one that was um, seemingly useful in many cases, and then we would stop. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the picture you described of, um, of methodologists creating all these parameters that may or may not be interesting, I, I think in part that's driven by a desire for practitioners, practitioners to pursue um, uh, parameters that have slightly different uh, properties, maybe under different assumptions, and maybe all of them sort of contribute to the body of evidence um, when applied to the same uh, uh, problem. I don't know if you want to stop and maybe comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I can comment on that. I mean, that's important to discuss this. I think the the sociological context here, because it's such a ambitious endeavor to do an impactful data analysis, and people are. It, it's almost too much to for one person to be an expert in all things, and that's why at least in public health, which is what I'm familiar with in clinical research. The research that we do is conducted by really large teams of people. And uh, and the interesting thing, or perhaps the the, chal the challenging thing, is that everyone has seems to have different incentives for promoting their career and so forth that isn't necessarily linked with, with like a, how successful or impactful our research is. So I think that plays an important role in kind of in this kind of this sociology of methods development and application. And we we just through necessity, we have to silo to some extent uh, expertise on methodology, on substantive issues. And that creates some need to attend to the connective tissue between the different uh, um, you know, people involved and and some responsibility to to do that and not sometimes get i think it can be very easy to get carried away by certain professional incentive incentive structures and our own, and you know you know this happens all the time in my own research uh, and and the curiosities and the passions i have for for certain features of the field that you know maybe are i can't say for certain how um how important they are um, and and to speak to your last point about just kind of having a um, almost a pluralistic approach to doing something like mediation, where we uh, where we recognize the value of a whole range of of different estimates and parameters, and we take parts from each of those to uh, to arrive at the best you know set of answers and understanding about a certain applied area. I can't say that's necessarily a bad thing, and especially sometimes in settings when we don't know exactly what we want to know yet, and we aren't going to be able to know exactly what we want to know yet just by talking about it. Sometimes we need to explore data, uh, and so there could be some value for that sort of approach, but at the same time, I think it's it's almost important to also articulate and attend to uh, what these kind of uh, like these the boundaries of the fields are and if the bound maybe the boundaries are defined by different ideal parameters and and certain more pragmatic parameters are are a little bit further away from these kind of goalposts but we know we can go into that process of of leveraging the answers we get from these different approaches with open eyes and understanding kind of where they fit in, where they're located on this more complicated uh, uh, space of formally defined causal parameters. Thanks, Aaron. I think you answered this question, but I also I want to make an additional comment. I th but I think your answer addressed it, which is that um, you also you know painted this environment for interpretive errors um, as one where you know methodologists have created different parameters. But I, I think that. Um, when, when I look at it, I think that the environment for interpretive errors existed before statisticians came and created methods. I think the environment exists because the questions are hard to articulate. It's hard to 
think about them in interventionalist terms. Um, people might disagree on what's of interest. Um, and there might be a lot of skepticism about different um, assumptions required to proceed in different directions. And so I think that environment exists, um, you know, before any different parameters are proposed um, or, or methods exist. Um, and I, I almost think that's, you know, a natural um, part of science. Um, so I, I want to ask you, I think you, you addressed that to some extent. So I want to ask you another question. I want to critique the normative aspect of your work. So um, I, I think you... Um, imply that we ought to take an ideal approach. We ought not to take a pragmatic approach. Um, and I think um, the, pragma the term pragma pragmatic approach, I think is a little bit troubling to me because I don't think we pick that approach because we see that it succeeds. Um, I think what it really is, is a pluralist, pluralistic approach. And, and you um, you gave me that term in your answer too. But um, I, you know, when I look at what happens in, um, uh, in science, and let's m move away from mediation, maybe think about a different example that you gave in your talk, which is, you know, the adjusted associational parameter versus, you know, the causal average treatment effect parameter that are identified by the same functional, but, you know, clearly require different assumptions. Um, this tension between asso association and causation is a, a rampant in observational studies that are published in you know, the medical literature, for example. And so um, what you showed in your systematic review, and I bet you this we would see this if we did it for the association versus causation problem, is that, well, when you look at the method sections, you know, there aren't um, interpretive errors. And then when you get into the discussion section, you start to see interpretive errors. And that, what I wonder is if that's a natural part of science, that, you know, when you are formulating the methods and you're applying them, you think in strict um, terms and um, uh, and you're careful about laying out what assumptions are required to proceed. And then when you get into the discussion section, well, now you take a sort of pluralistic approach and you now you're creative. Um, now you extrapolate. Now you consider other possibilities. You entertain other assumptions. Um, and um, I, I worry that the ideal approach um, is too strict and it restricts that creativity, that extrapolation that I think is maybe really important and a very natural part of science. Yeah, that's, it's restrictive in the sense that it forces you to be very explicit about certain things. But on the other hand, it can might also foster fantasy because by being, being pushed to the corner about being precise, that might also help you realize where you weren't precise and may also come up then with better estimates. So I, I, I see that point and I see that there should be rooms for thinking creatively and loosely without being in this like very defined frame of a, say an interventionist framework. Uh, that said, um, I'm a bit concerned if, if the discussions in a high impact clinical paper would be very different from what they could actually infer from their methodology. So I would maybe prefer that to be on the conservative side, which seems also to be how decisions are made in say FDA and, and other organs where they want, want to be very conservative about how they make decisions based on new papers. And, and another type of argument is that maybe we don't need these very long and elaborative discussions if everything is very clear from the methodology and everybody are able to speak the same succinct language when they, when they write, write those parts and the results parts of the papers. Just to add on to that, I think you um, you put your finger on maybe a not a soft spot, but a kind of a dark spot, like or uh, like a opaque spot in, in this in the story that we're telling, which is okay. Maybe we can argue that interpretive errors are happening, and maybe they're happening more under certain types of pragmatic approaches. But what effects in terms of impact on real people's lives, public health, is that having? And the answer is, I don't know, because that's an extraordinarily difficult, in principle, empirical question to answer, but we don't have data on that. So it's just kind of conjecture um, that this could cause actually real harm beyond words on, on paper. Um, but just to setting, setting that aside also, responding to something else that you said about restrictions and constraining that kind of the, the scope of behavior and practice and this idea that this field for interpretive errors existed before 
uh, you know, so-called pragmatism arose in the methodological literature. I think you're absolutely right about that as well. And I don't think even if Mats and I took a, a really hard line approach, which I don't think we really are, uh, um, that wouldn't go that wouldn't go away. Uh, and I guess one of the metaphors that I like to in thinking about this is is this met metaphor from behavioral economics of of you know designing supermarkets, the layout of cafeterias and supermarkets, so that people can make healthier choices. But ultimately, they know when it's okay to have a piece of cake or something like that. But they but uh, you know they have a certain type of uh, they can go into that with open eyes and they have like an incentive structure that it's going to naturally without too much intervention protect them from making more malignant errors uh, so that's kind of how i think about this call for you know attending more to this ideal approach that kind of is began with some of the, the origins of, of the causal revolution in the 80s and 90s so that's a nudge toward being more ideal than yeah. pragmatic, but no. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, thank you all. Um, so we, maybe you can stay on for a few minutes longer. There are a couple of questions in the Q&A. And Alon is catching up, but maybe I can read out loud one question so you can comment on it live. Uh, so one uh, asks, you argued that when discussing discrimination cases, for example, by sex or race, the counterfactual contrast as specified by Pearl is not the one of interest. Granted that this contrast is not generally identifiable without untestable assumptions, don't you think humans intuitively adopt this thinking when reasoning about fairness? Following the general rationale of your talk, which I very much agree on, don't you think we should still formalize the real uh, research question rather than turning to estimates that are easier to identify? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I I just, yeah, I agree with this, the very much 100% agree with being very explicit about the research question. And and I think the causal language and being formal has been good in, in the way that they've been able to allow us realize what questions we can ask and might not be able to ask in fairness settings, and also what the interpretation are of several of the parameters that are reported in fairness settings. Now, when it comes to actually defining fairness in a causal or non-causal way, I don't really know how to do that. I People have different utilities and loss functions and ideas about what is fair, and it seems to be difficult to formalize that in a way that everybody agrees with, essentially. And that's also reflected in the myriad of definitions of fairness in that literature, which seems to expand a lot every day. So. The formalizations are good, but I, I still don't know exactly where we at, are at with those definitions, except that I think formalization helps us understand more the limitations and when they possibly might be useful. But when I have a problem, I don't really know which definition I, I, I am to choose, essentially. So along that line, there is one last question. Uh, so they say, who judges what is exactly an interpretation of error? It seems problematic to say to researchers, you are in, in an error because you really should have targeted a different parameter according to our view. Yeah, you can answer that. Yeah, but well, I can just say, you know, like just how we coded, elaborate a little bit more on how we coded an interpretational error. So we look in the method, in the method section of the paper and see that they explicitly target, for example, a stochastic mediation parameter. And maybe they even write an introduction that they targeted this mediation, this stochastic mediation parameter precisely because they, when they were, when they were trying to articulate a causal model, they saw that they had a recanting witness structure uh, to, you know, to a DAG that they drew, for example. And then they realized that they couldn't identify the natural direct effect, so they they decided to study this alternative parameter. Uh, but then, if we go look in the methods or in the results or discussion section, they'll talk about they'll make statements like uh, that they that you know their indirect effect or the direct effect explains X percent of the total effect. And we know that under that model that they assumed, that 
the randomized interventional analog does not decompose a total effect. It decomposes uh, you know, a population analog, a randomized interventional analog of the total effect. Uh, so they're making an, an they're they're making a claim and interpreting uh, part of their analysis in a way that is in conflict with the parameter that they said explicitly that they were going to target. So then you can you can flag that as an interpretational interpretational error. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Thank you so much to everyone, our speakers and this discussants for this thought-provoking conversation. Um, we have to wrap up, but if uh, I ask the audience, if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to the speakers directly. And uh, with that, I pass it to Emma for the wrap up. Thank you, Razi. So uh, could you please stop sharing the screen? That would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, all right. Start this. Okay. Great. Oh. <laughs> so one more thing. Uh, so thank you again, Matt and Aaron and Vanessa and Carlos and Lon for answering a lot of questions. All the questions that we didn't get to answer as well as the ones that were answered uh, will be passed on to the speakers, including the answers uh, after the talk. So if your question didn't get to be answered and you'd still like to follow up, please do. Uh, they should have access to the conversation. Also, uh, thank you all for coming to these seminars this fall, and thank you to Razi for uh, stepping up to be another new moderator in our online causal inference seminar. Uh, we have now a winter break, so we won't have talks for the rest of December. We'll start back up in January, and there should be announcements soon on the website in terms of uh, our thematic series, which we'll have for the January weeks. So thank you all for coming and uh, yeah, that's it. Have a great day.